Hello everybody, and welcome to another episode of Andy's Witchcraft by me, Sacred Moon. I hope you're all having a wonderful day so far. Today's episode, we are going to start a little series um, on discussing elemental magic. Each episode is going to cover one element. Today I'm going to introduce to you what elemental magic is, why it's important in witchcraft, and then we're going to go into the element of water. So let's get started, shall we? Since the beginning of history, the elements have been the cornerstones of magical workings. As the name states, elemental magic is a form of magic that revolves around the elements. These four basic elements create the boundaries and structures within a larger spiritual framework. I'm going to briefly discuss the four elements. You probably know them by now, but uh, briefly what each is associated with. Um, And then each episode is going to go into detail of it. So the first we have water, which is the rain from the skies, the world's oceans, lakes, comforting bath, the morning dew in the air. Water is extremely important because it is in our blood, in our sweat, but it's also in our memories. It rules over our emotions and manifests as tears. Next, we have earth, which is the ground that we walk on, literally. It is the rocks, the mud, the mountains, but it's also our body itself and the physical manifestations in this life. This is where we find our center and stability. So whenever you're working on grounding yourself, um, you will be probably working with the earth element. Next, we have fire which is the flame in the in the hearth Um, and it's in the candles the bonfires the sun it warms but it also is destroys Um, and it has the power to transform and incite whenever you want to work on igniting passion and motivation working with the fire element really is good for that finally we have air which is all around us it's in our breath the sounds we hear, the wind that touches our faces. It carries seeds and pollen to allow life to grow with the changing seasons. It's in the smells that you smell during your day. Um, And it's in songs and music. Air is in our voice, our thoughts, and our ideas. Whenever you're using music to manifest or music um, in your spells, you are working with the air element. For modern day witches, the elements are also represented in magical tools. Um, And so for water, it's represented by the chalice or cups. Uh, Earth is represented by pentacles. Fire is represented by the wand. And air is represented by the atham or the sword. When you work with any one of these elements, you are accessing some of the primal forces and building blocks of life and the universe itself. The elements provide spiritual guidance for daily med- meditations, visualizations, spell work, or life lessons. Throughout your day, you might ask, what element do I need to get through today? Um, and working with that element may help you. Today, like I said, we are starting with water magic, and before I get into it, I could just, I'm just going to put it out there that I could say it was randomly chosen to be first, but really, I'd be lying. I love using water and magic. I make my own holy water and moon water, and I love that, and my chart is water sign dominant. Emotions are a big part of my craft, working with my emotions, doing shadow work, and so... I decided to start with the water element. So let's get started with that. Before we get into the witchcraft rituals and stuff involving water, I wanted to begin by stating some associations with water. So first we have the zodiac signs. There are three zodiac signs that are water signs and those are Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces. Next are the planets. These are the moon, which isn't really a planet, but you know what I mean. (laughs) Uh, Pluto and Neptune. 
The color strongly associated with water is blue for obvious reasons. The tarot suit is a cups or chalices. The cardinal direction is west. So a lot of times when you are placing the chalice full of a liquid on your altar, you would place it on the west side of your altar. Um, and yeah, that's just to uh, correspond it. The time of day associated with the water element is twilight. The season is autumn or fall. And like I said before, water is strongly associated with emotions, not only the positive ones, but the negative ones as well. These can include love, compassion, empathy, deception, fear, spite, jealousy. A quote that I read in a book on elemental magic, um, the book was Elemental Divination by Stephen Ball. And I love it, so I'm going to read it here. It says, For every healing goddess of love connected to the sea, there are sirens and monsters who deceive and kill. So it just shows there is a love and light side of working with the water element, but there's also that dark side, like in shadow work, in the emotions that you want to change about yourself that may um, make life more difficult for you. The water element is strongly associated with intuition, reflection, dreams, prophesying, and illusions. And it is associated with feminine energy or fertility. In crystal paganism, water is strongly associated with the Holy Spirit. And I personally believe the Holy Spirit is Asherah. Um, and so when working with her, I, I like to include the water element in my workings. So, why is water so important in witchcraft? A quote by Lauren Isley is, If there is magic on this planet, it is contained in water. Water is sacred. It's ancient. It's older than life itself. And it has been around since the beginning of time. For this reason, it is thought to be the source of all life. Both literally and figuratively, humans are born in water when we're carried in the amniotic sac that is water and you are cleansed and i personally believe that even if you're reincarnated because you lose the memories of your previous life you're starting fresh you are starting cleansed and what's the best way to do that it's to be born in water to purify to cleanse and start new in witchcraft water is used for healing cleansing and purification it is by nature healing, and so it's very important to use in your witchy practices. So, how can we practice water magic? I'm going to list some rituals and some ideas that you can include water in um, just to get you involved in using water magic. The first suggestion I have is to make moon water. Obviously, the instructions are simple. You fill a glass jar with water. You place it out where it can get exposed to moonlight. And then take it out before the sun rises because then it's not moon water anymore. Um, but an, a thing I wanted to add is that you can use any type of water to do this. You could use rainwater, water from a river, a lake, an ocean, storm water, um, any kind of water really will work for this. Just be sure that if you're getting it from like at the outside, so like rain or your local beaches, that you are not consuming it because that's not safe. But you get the idea. You could use this water in your spell works, your jar, your spell jars, your um, if you're putting the candle in water for whatever reason, you can do that. Um, and it's just really good to get in touch with your emotions. And like I said, the divine feminine, you can use moon water for that. A bonus thing you could do is that when you bring the jar inside, you can label it with the date, the moon phase, the weather conditions, and any astrological events like planets in retrograde, if it's a eclipse, you know, anything like that. Um, and this is good if you want to use a particular type of moon water for spell work. Um, so if you want to use storm water for your hexes or curses, you could do that just to keep track, especially if you have multiple jars full of water. And a tip I have is that when you have it in a jar, store it in a dark place away from the sun. 
Um, that way, again, it just stays moon water. If you want to know what moon phase is best for a particular intention, I have a moon phases and moon magic episode, which I will link below. Um, and that can help you how, out on guiding, uh, scheduling out your moon water for particular purposes. The next suggestion I have is to make sun water. This is the same instructions for moon water, but you're placing it out during the day when the sun is out. Um, and it's great for water purification. You can use sun water to cleanse energetic blocks, remove negativity from yourself, and also removing it from your space. The next suggestion I have is to make holy water, especially if you're a Christian witch and you want to do holy water. But really, you can holy water isn't necessarily a Christian thing now that I think about it. You could use it. Any kind of water can be holy as long as it, you believe it is blessed by the universe or your deities, whatever you, whoever you work with, believe in, whatever higher power, you can make some holy water with them. It's basically just regular water with a little bit of salt added to it. Usually you would say a blessing or invocation above it, and then that would make it holy. And I believe you could do this yourself. You don't need a priest to consecrate water. The church teaches that we all have the Holy Spirit within us. We are all born of the Holy Spirit. And so we should be capable of putting that out into our workings and making holy water. That's my personal opinion. That's why I make my own holy water. I don't like to use outside institutions for my craft. So that's what I do. And I also always charge my holy water in both the sunlight and the moonlight. And I believe it just charges it with the energy of the divine masculine and feminine. But again, you could do it however you want. You could add whatever you want to that holy water, whatever you feel called to. Just be sure if you are consuming it, only put consumable ingredients in it. That's all I got to say. The next suggestion I have is to make a cleansing spray. Now, you can use any ingredients you feel called to, but I'm going to give my personal recipe for my cleansing spray, which I make, and I spray during, um, usually I do it during a new moon phase, I do my cleansing, and so that's, yeah. So, my cleansing spray, I would usually put moon water or beach water in it, lavender, salt, cloves, rosemary, anointed holy oil, and mint essential oil. These ingredients promote protection, purity, and cleanliness, and they just help remove any negative blocks I may have. The next suggestion I have for using water in your craft is to make a purification protection bath. Basically, um, to do this, there are many ways, but the way I like to do it, and I found this online, so really I can't take credit for it, is to bring two cups of water to a boil and then add bay leaves and anise seeds and salt in it. The water, salt are really great at washing away the negativity and unwanted energies, and the bay leaves and anise seeds are purifiers and protectors. Um, then you would allow the mixture to simmer for about five minutes-ish. Then you would turn off your stove um, and let it cool down to room temperature. Because again, you're putting this mixture in your bath. So don't burn yourself with this. <laughs> As this is cooling down, you could start to fill your bath with warm water. And then you could add more salt if you want. And then, and then once that is done and the mixture is cool, you can add that into your bath and stir the bath counterclockwise for banishment and then clockwise for protection and luck. You could also additionally hold out your hands over the water and envision the bath filling with golden purifying light. Um, I personally also start to pray the Our Father to ask uh, Yahweh to empower the bath with their with uh, his energy and then I may also just say a quick incantation to ask Asherah to do the same as well. I also start to read Bible verses about what the water's holy properties which you'll hear some of them at the end of this episode um, and then I bathe for as long as I wish. Um, if you don't have a bathtub 
You can easily pour the mixture over you in the shower, um, but be sure to strain out the bay leaves and the anise seeds um, because you don't want to pour that on your head. <laughs> um, and so uh, an important note is that this infusion is very potent, so don't let it sit on your skin for too, too long. If you feel any irritation, rash, or burning, you know, be cautious. You know your body best. You know when to stop, so listen to it. Don't be stubborn for the sake of your craft. Take care of yourselves. The next suggestion I have for working with the water element is a water meditation. You can meditate in the bath or in the shower, and you can even do this at the beach, in a lake or ocean, whatever you feel called to do. Once you sit in the water, um, you would start to feel the water surrounding your body and your limbs. Make it move around gently, pushing your hands outward and then inward to push the water away and towards you. Feel the back and forth flowing of the wave on the surface and below. Picture as the water outside your body continues into your blood, matching with it. Um, and then feel as you become one with the water. Feel your blood rushing and moving around your head, your arms, your chest, your legs, and then feel the internal waves circul circulating through you. At this point, you could start to take deep breaths. You could shut your eyes, do whatever helps you during meditation, and do it for as long as needed until you feel satisfied. If you don't like to sit or swim in water, you could do the same thing with a glass of water. So you would just sit down somewhere quiet where you're not disturbed, set the glass of water in front of you. Then you'd start to drink the water, taking it into your body, feel it go down your throat and feel it mix with your blood as new blood is produced and feel the blood spread throughout your body to heal all parts of yourself. My final suggestion for you to work with the water element is to work with water spirits. Water spirits are those who regulate tides, direct the flows of rivers and streams, and bring in rains. They may also protect aquatic life. A big, big warning and caution. I'm putting it out there. Some are malevolent. Some are causing storms. Many are believed to cause sinking or missing ships. So do your research. A lot of these are from the category of fae folk. And so if you want to learn about the fae, I have a podcast episode on that as well, which I will link and hopefully give you some good beginner friendly tips for working with some of these creatures. Examples of water spirits are undines, nymphs, marrows, sprites, mermaids, and some of the more scarier quote-unquote ones are banshees, sirens, vodianoi, rusalka, manajishi, kelpies, and each wish. Okay, so I just paused the recording to <laughs> look up how to record, how to pronounce that. I was way off. It's ich ushka. <laughs> So those are some of those um, water spirits. So a way that I personally connect to water spirits is obviously by going to a local water source to visit them. It's especially powerful to do this during the full or new moon. The way you would go about this is to find a quiet spot along the water where you will not be disturbed and pick up any trash that you may find. Obviously, that's the first thing you should do because you wanna show that you mean no harm. So by picking up trash and taking care of their home, you're going to instill um, so a feeling of safety with some of these creatures. As you're doing this, you can get into like a quote unquote meditation stance and observe your surroundings and really try to connect to them. Focus on what plants are growing along the banks, what animals you see, and how the water feels when you touch it. Feel the energy of the water and let it wash over you. At this point, 
this is when you would determine whether the water spirits are ready to do a working with you or not. Um, if the energy you're feeling when you touch the water is light and receptive, you can continue with the ritual. But if you feel uneasy, unwelcome, or a sense of like doom, stop. Stop, first of all. Um, and depending on the spirit that is reaching out to you, you can thank them. If they're part of the fey creatures, don't thank them. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so you could thank some of the spirits, um, and then leave. And you could try again on another day if you feel called to, but if not, no harm, no foul. If you feel that the spirits are open to communication, you get that light and receptive energy, you can start to walk into the water if you feel safe doing that and if possible. But if not, you could dip your hands into the water again. Um, close your eyes and again you're going to feel yourself becoming one with the water. Pause and listen and pay close attention to signs or messages from the water spirits. Especially if there are animals around you, um, take, pay attention to their behaviors as it may be signs from these spirits. If you don't see anything with your physical eye, try to sense the sort of aura of it. Do you sense anything on the spiritual plane? When you close your eyes, do you get any visions? If so, what are they? Think about these as you're doing this. When you are satisfied with the encounter, you can tell the spirits that, if you feel called to do this, of course, that you are going to take some water to place on your altar to charge with positive intent. And be sure that, again, you get that light and receptive response that shows that you're getting permission to do this. And then out of respect for them, you want to leave an offering. So kind of like a trade. I take water and I leave you some strawberries or some leaves. Um, anything that you want. Seashells even. And then after that, you can go home. You could do your own, whatever working you want to do with that water. And you want to keep doing these rituals as often as possible because the more you visit and work with these spirits, the more likely they are to help you. So that is it for my water ritual suggestions. Now I want to kind of get into, so you guys all know this, I say it every episode, I am a crystal pagan Buddhist. So in both the crystal paganist side and the Buddhist side, water is sacred. So I wanted to touch on why water is seen as sacred in Buddhism in particular. And then after that, we're going to go into Bible verses that show the sacredness of water. So in Buddhism, similar to many cultures and what I've said before, it is seen as a life giver and representing of purity, clarity, and calmness. Buddhist monks use water in many rituals in all aspects of their life. For example, Thai Buddhists have ceremonial uses of water. Um, water is purified by monks that are chanting, and that is their version of holy water. Again, like I said, it's not a purely Christian concept. Buddhists have their own holy water, and when they make it, they use it for blessings for anniversaries, birthdays, marriage ceremonies, and even funerals. Buddhist communities in Cambodia even bathe elderly parents or grandparents using water, soap, perfume, and flowers, and they perform a ritual to apologize for mistakes that they made in the pre previous year. They also do this to receive blessings and also bless the elders with long life. In the Vajrayana Buddhism um, sect, uh, seven bowls of water are offered to the Buddha and other holy figures as a remedy for greed. So they use it as an offering, um, an apology. Because again, it represents purity. It represents uh, wanting to heal the harm that you caused in the past. In a funerals, Buddhists believe that after dying, the body returns to the four elements while the soul reincarnates. So all the elements are seen as important during Buddhist funerals. However, water is specifically used during a ritual bathing ceremony where water is repeatedly poured over the hands of the deceased from a special flask or water pot. So this is, again, to cleanse the body and also cleanse the soul um, 
kind of because that body is the last attachment of the soul before it reincarnates into the next life. And so by cleansing it, you're going to try to extend that purification process to the soul. Water in Buddhist cultures is seen as, again, a sort of like not medical treatment, but a holistic treatment. That's the word. Um, and so they believe that water has a humble attitude, so to speak, because a lot of them are animists. Everything is living to them, including water. And so water has a humble attitude. By cleaning yourself with water and doing these rituals with water, you are extending that humble attitude to yourself, your body, your soul, your spirit. And this will help you reach enlightenment eventually. So that is why in Buddhist um, cultures, pouring water on the body is important. And holy water is extremely um, common in many uh, monks' uh, rituals. So now I want to go on to Bible verses on water elemental magic, just to finish off the episode. So from the beginning of the Bible, water has, is mentioned. It is mentioned first in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So from the beginning, water was there. Before even human, before Adam and Eve, water was there. So you could say it was kind of like the origin of life, so to speak. Water in the Bible represents purity, cleanliness, protection, and the Holy Spirit. So you can hear me say that so many times, but like, what's the quote unquote evidence of this? Where are the Bible verses that support this? I'm about to list them. And there is quite a few, a few. So stick around. <laughs> the first verse I have is Psalms chapter 63, verse one. You God are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water. Next, we have Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and the streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Next, we have Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 to 26. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. The next verse I have is Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. This is when John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The next verse is John chapter 4, verses 4 through 10. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The next verse I have is Acts chapter 10 verse 47. Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. The next verse is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to her to make her holy, 
cleansing her by washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without strain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. I want to pause at this verse because it can seem like it's about a husband controlling his wife and making her out to be the perfect wife who's pure and perfect and the husband doesn't have to worry about himself and whatever. But that's not what I mean. That, like, that's not what I think it means, at least. I interpret it to mean to care and cherish your spouse, to take care of, uh, of her, to tra not traumatize her, this is the bare minimum is not to traumatize her, and to be there for her when she needs support and compassion. You can make her holy and blameless in the sense that she is happy and healthy. Because we all know that trauma can corrupt our minds and our souls. Trauma has a huge impact on it. So by caring for her, we are preventing that corruption, so to speak. The verse obviously says husbands to do it to wives and not wives to do it to husbands. Because at the time, wives had no control. They couldn't get a job. They uh, were expected to stay home and have kids. Um, if they didn't get a husband, they'd be essentially homeless. And so it said husbands to love the wives because that was their, their job. Because the wives can't do anything really except for staying home and cooking and cleaning. So again, it's important to take it into context. With a lot of the Bible verses, we have to consider the cultural context. And the fact that men were expected to take care of the wives. Because the wives couldn't take care of themselves realistically. The next verse, going back, to, um, is um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Next, we have 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And finally, we have Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. So all of these verses discuss as water living or giving life. So there's a lot of proof there and there are many, many more Bible verses, I'm sure. This was just a little bit, believe me, just a small percentage. I want to finish off this episode by saying that even though water can represent the good, even in the Bible, it can represent the bad. It represents barriers and challenges, which is similar to like the negative emotions that um, witches believe that water can represent. There are two Bible verses I want to focus on this point. 2 Samuel chapter 22 verse 17 says, He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. In that verse, he wanted to get out of the water. He didn't want to be in. <laughs> and then Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. So water is a balance between good and bad, um, between being pure and less pure. I don't want to say corrupt because negative emotions aren't necessarily corrupt. They're normal, they're natural, but they do have a huge weight on the soul. That's about it for this episode. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, if you liked it and you're on YouTube, uh, give it a like, a comment, and a subscribe. And if you're listening on Spotify, follow for getting for your updates on future episodes. If you have a video idea, please, please, please send it to me. I want to hear your ideas. In the link tree, you click on it. Click on what is labeled video ideas. It is a Google form. Fill it out and then 
I will be sure to get an episode out as soon as I can on whatever topic you want me to cover. In the link tree, you could also access all my spot of uh, my um uh, my social media accounts to follow me. I also post updates and sometimes I post little Canva posts on brief recaps of these episodes that you can use for notes. Um, so you could check that out as well. And if you want to join a community of witches who are compassionate, um, who share their craft um, in a non-judgmental space, I have a Discord server uh, the Crystal Caverns. You could check that out. The link is in the link tree below as well. And that's about it for today. Blessed be everyone. Have a wonderful day, week, month, and year.